Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 199. In today's episode, you are going to hear my conversation with Claire Banton of Library and Archives Canada. She'll be talking about Canada's 150th anniversary and genealogy resources at Library and Archives Canada, including their free Skype a genealogy service. Looking forward to hearing more about that. I'll also be telling you what's coming for our own Genealogy Gems anniversary celebration. And I'll talk about an exciting new piece of technology. It's Google Earth VR. And the VR stands for virtual reality. And yes, it is just as cool as it sounds. And I've got an inspiring follow-up email to share with you from Gay, whose YouTube story I shared last month, and a great conference tip from Barbara just in time for Roots Tech, which is coming up here. Later in the show, Genealogy Gems book club guru Sonny Morton will announce the newest book club title in our lineup. And your DNA guide, Diane Southard, is going to be here to share some thoughts about DNA testing with children. And, you know, speaking of kids, we had a wonderful time with kids over the holidays. I hope you had a wonderful holiday with your family, Christmas and Hanukkah and New Year's, so much going on. We had a great time. We took the whole family out to a place called Gaylord Texan. Now, I believe they have these Gaylord Resort places uh, in different places around the country. Uh, This was new to me. It's not far from where we live. It's over by the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And it's this huge kind of like mega indoor resort. And in the summer, they have water slides and all kinds of stuff going on. But in the winter, they do this ice festival. And so we took an evening between Christmas and New Year's and wrangled everybody up in the same place again, two times in the same month. I was pretty impressed with myself that I managed to pull that off. Got all the spouses, got the grandkids there. So It was so funny because we went to the steakhouse at the Gaylord Texan and holy moly, that was good. It was amazing. And they just outdid themselves. So we had all nine of us around the table. And I I told my daughter, uh, Vienna, I said, I want to have Joey and Davey sit on either side of me. So the two grandkids, uh, Joey is four, Davey is seven, just turned seven, had a seventh birthday in December. So we're sitting there and they're on either side of me and I'm at the end of the table and my husband's on the other far end of the table and we're all visiting and I think we've gotten through maybe the appetizers and such and we were all talking and then the the dinners arrived. So of course we got Joey the hamburger and french fries and Davey the chicken tenders and (laughs) so funny I looked over and he's, he's putting french fries in his mouth one at a time and it's getting slower and it's getting slower and I look down on my right shoulder and he just has an, a french fry in midair and he starts tilting backwards and he fell asleep in that spot. It was hysterical. I don't remember my kids ever just falling asleep in mid-bite. That was so funny. And it's in the middle of this big restaurant and all these things going on and lights and nope, he checked out. He was done. <laughs> he was tired. It was It was so cute. So as my husband says, I was in Shasha heaven because I just picked him up, threw him over my arm, kept one arm free and kept eating and talking and he just slept through the whole meal. It was fabulous. So that was a lot of fun. And of course, it's always amazing and enjoyable to to have kids with you anytime you go look at Christmas lights and the Gaylord Texan had massive Christmas lights everywhere. Just oh, these amazing displays throughout this entire indoor resort area. It was really cool. So we had a lot of fun doing that and made lots of memories. And you know, what was funny. Um, I don't know about you, but doesn't it just feel like everybody's life is on Facebook? And it's wonderful that we are taking pictures and we're taking videos with our phones and everybody's putting things online. And that's great. Even if it's not on Facebook, you probably still have maybe a mobile device of some type and you're taking pictures. I got through Christmas and I realized I didn't have a single photograph. 
How did that happen? Now, I took one or two little short videos because we got the kids um, (laughs) those little lights on the straps that go around your head, your forehead. I guess people use them when they're working on cars and stuff. Anyway, so they were crawling around under the tree looking for presents and bringing them out for everybody. And they had their minor lights on. It was so cute. But I said to Bill afterward, I said, I can't believe this. I have a couple of videos. I don't have a single photograph to show for Christmas. And he said, huh, I guess you were just in the moment. (laughs) Yeah, I was. And that's okay, isn't it? It's okay to just be in the moment. So I did not capture pictures of every single smile and present and all that stuff. But it is all ingrained in my memory because this time I wasn't looking through the screen of my iPhone. So I recommend it. it. It was actually very nice. It was a very, very nice way to spend Christmas. But I do enjoy my photos. And I have been enjoying being on Instagram. I am on Instagram now. I, I wonder if you are. Do you know that I'll just tell you a secret? Okay, come on over here. Quick, I have to tell you something. I like it better than Facebook. I do. I like it better than Facebook. Now, Genealogy Gems Podcast is on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. I really don't do a whole lot personally on Facebook. I put the occasional thing up there and check stuff out. But I don't know. I got too much else to do, right? You know, I've got genealogy to do and that kind of thing and podcasts to make. And I love doing all that. So I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook. But we do put some real effort into putting great content onto the Genealogy Gems Facebook page. And I know many, many of you are following us there. And that's fun. Well, Instagram, I always thought of as just a teenager thing, but it's not. It's uh, if you like visual stuff, if you like pictures, and I'm a picture person, I'm a visual person. Don't read it to me, show it to me, right? That's how I learn. I am just loving it. And I have to tell you, there's something about the structure of it and the way people post things. It's a much more positive place. If you have felt that Facebook isn't always the most positive place, which I think that's true. Um, we, we try to be very, very positive on, on genealogy gems, but Instagram is just really upbeat. Now, maybe it's the people I'm following. We always say genealogists are some of the nicest people you're, you'll ever meet, but they are especially nice. And people are posting what resonates with them, what's in their hearts, what's on their desk, what their kids are doing. And I have had a blast. It's been getting me into all these amazing photography type apps. And and, uh, I'll be talking more about those apps. You know, I'm all about mobile genealogy. And and I wrote a book about it. Well, I'm always still hunting down the, the awesome apps. And there are some really great ones. You'll be hearing more about those in the coming weeks and months. So anyway, if you haven't checked us out, it's my account. It, I guess it's it's called Genealogy Gems, but it's it's basically me, moi, doing it. Um, go on Instagram. It's a free app. And just check it out. And you'll see a lot of the people that I'm following. They're, they're almost all genealogists. They've got some great content on there, too. So if you just need a little boost, a little ins- inspiration, it's a really fun place to be. Oh, and I forgot to tell you why it was a little bit easier to, for us to get everybody together over Christmas. Because my youngest, Hannah, and her husband, Ryan, have moved to Texas. It's official. We are all here. <laughs> I am so happy. My older two, Lacey and Vienna, and Vienna and her husband and her kids, they're all in Texas. We're in Texas. Hannah and Ryan are now Texans. They have moved to Austin, and we love it. It's only about three hours away, and uh, they are living the dream and and doing all the things they love. And Hannah is working part-time, virtually, for Genealogy Gems. If you're going to be at Roots Tech, you're going to meet Hannah. So she'll be there. And if you have been to some of the seminars that I did in the last quarter of 2016, you've already met Hannah. And she's awesome. She is um bubbly personality and uh, an avid athlete. So she's great for moving all those books. (laughs) She's a very strong gal, okay? And she's also just a a love. So I know that you'll enjoy meeting her this year. She's going to be traveling all 2017 with me. Uh, Lacey is still here, but boy, she is managing things full time here in the offices. So Hannah's going to be doing some traveling with me this year, and I'm excited about it. 
So that's my kid news. I just had to catch up because it's a new year. And you know, they keep growing up so fast. And I want you to stay in touch with our family. I love staying in touch with your family. And I love the fact that you write me about your family and what you're doing. And we're going to be talking about that in the mailbox segment here shortly. But first, I wanted to cover a couple of newsy item things that we want to make sure we touch base on. You know, as I mentioned, 2017 is the 10th anniversary of the Genealogy Gems podcast. Can you believe that? 10 years, and we are going to be celebrating all year with extra special new interviews, fan favorite topics, and a lot more stuff that you're going to look forward to. Uh, I am going to be throwing the official party next month. It's going to be in episode 200. Because, well, it's episode 200. Can you believe that? 200. And it's falling at the 10-year anniversary. It's amazing. Uh, so that's a great milestone. And it, it actually is going to publish the week uh, that the anniversary occurs, that second week in February. So to get ready for all of this celebration festivities, I'm inviting all of you to sign kind of a virtual card so to speak, uh, by sending in all your well wishes, your memories, your thoughts, all that good stuff. I'd like you to email me. I know I I ask you and many of you do, but I have checked a few of you have not yet. So get busy, get the email program out. Email genealogy gems podcast at gmail.com or call into our voicemail line. And that number is 925 272 4021. And of course, that is so cool because then we get to have you on the show. And I love hearing your sweet voices and, and it just makes you all the more real for all of us here. So uh, do that. And that means we can also put it onto the podcast and not just be reading it, which we are happy to do, but we love hearing you too. So wh- whether you email or you call in, tell us your first name, um, where you live, And maybe when you started listening to the show, are you a newbie? Are you one of the uh, early adopters? And I'd love to hear what's one of your favorite things that you've learned from the podcast? What's something that had an impact on something that you were doing? Whatever it is, share it with us. We'd love to share it and make it part of our festivities here on the podcast. If you do this by January 31st of 2017... As a thank you, I'm going to be randomly selecting one response to receive a free year of Genealogy Gems premium membership. So if you are already a member, that means you get to add it on to your current membership, uh, or you can give it as a gift. If you're new, you're going to love it because premium membership is awesome. And there's so much more going on over there. So you'll find that email address, the voicemail number that I gave you in the show notes on our website or in the Genealogy Gems app for this episode. It's $199, um, along with all the information that we're talking about, all the takeaway information from this episode you'll find there. On the on the website, you just head to genealogygems.com, hover your mouse over podcast, and click on Genealogy Gems. And then you just go to episode 199. For those of you on the app, it's built right into the episode. So you've got show notes. Uh, I don't know if it's called bonus content or but I haven't looked at it lately, but you can tap right through to it there. And thank you so much, really, from all of us here at Genealogy Gems for helping celebrate the 10 years of doing what we really love to do. And we're so glad that you're here with us. Now, as I said, the actual anniversary does fall the second week of February in 2017. And that just happens to be when we are going to be at a huge National Roots Tech conference in Salt Lake City. And Roots Tech runs from February 8th through the 11th of 2017. So if by chance you're going to be there, be sure and come by and help us celebrate. It's going to be awesome at our booth. It's booth number 1039. And just about the entire Genealogy Gem team is is going to be there. We're going to be presenting Roots Tech lectures, all of us. So you're going to have a lot of gems to choose from, from the Roots Tech uh, schedule. I will be teaching uh, our DNA expert, Diane Southard, my podcast editor and book club guru, Sunny Morton, and of course, our newest Genealogy Gems blogger, Amy Tennant. So all of us are going to have classes. We will also be giving free 30-minute power sessions on our favorite hot topics in our Genealogy Gems. We call the theater in our booth there. We have kind of a large 
section of booths all together. It's us, it's Diane, it's Family Tree Magazine. We're all in one this year. And our power sessions have become a real Roots Tech tradition. So once again, we are going to include uh, a few special guests from Family Tree Magazine and Family Tree University as part of the lineup. And you'll be hearing, of course, from all of the rest of us as well. And as with last year, anyone who attends one of our sessions there at Roots Tech uh, can sign up and receive our free ebook. It has all of the handouts for all of the sessions that we're going to be doing throughout the conference. But what's new this year and part of our 10 year celebration is that we will have a prize drawing at every session we teach at our booth and a mega grand prize drawing on Saturday during the lunch hour. We have got some incredible prizes. Lacey has been so busy digging these up. Ancestry subscriptions from Ancestry.com, the full year subscription. DNA tests, we've got software that you're going to love, um, books, all kinds of really cool stuff. And so much of it came from our friends and our partners in the genealogy community who have just been so generous in providing many of these. We're going to have subscriptions to Animoto, right? The video program I told you about, they're going to be there. Oh, Beth is awesome. She's giving us all kinds of uh, the subscription and some swag. We've got Famicity, which is a new company I'll be telling you about. Roots Magic, of course, and uh, so many of these wonderful, great companies. They're, all the prizes are going to be listed at our website. I'll give you that link in a moment. Um, but you aren't going to m- want to miss this because every single session, I kid you not, we're going to be doing a drawing. And again, the show notes for this episode are going to link over to our full Roots Tech presentation schedule. So be sure and check that out. And follow Genealogy Gems on Facebook if you're on Facebook, because that is where you do get the instant updates that really are going to be instantly updated up until the conference happens. And don't worry if you are not going to make it all the way to Roots Tech. That's understandable. But we're going to bring the celebration at our booth to you once again. So we're going to be streaming some of our power sessions live over the free Periscope app. I know lots and lots of you joined us last year uh, over Periscope. So if you don't have Periscope yet, head to your app store on your mobile device and download it so that you can join in the party from afar. You can do it from home. You can do it from the doctor's office. You can do it from the library, wherever you are. And as soon as we've got those sessions selected that we're going to be streaming live, we are going to post that schedule on Facebook and at our webpage. Ready? Genealogygems.com slash Roots Tech. Pretty easy to remember. And it's going to have lots of great, great info about all that stuff that's going on. So we're looking forward to connecting with you no matter where you're going to be that second week in February. And in other news, and this ties back to that company I mentioned, Femicity. So last year at Roots Tech 2016, uh, at the Innovator Showdown, which is kind of their tech company um, contest, one of the semifinalist entries really caught my eye. It was Femicity. Think of it as like family, fam, icity, like a family city. How about that? Famicity is a free private website for families where you can share pictures, videos, memories, family activities. It's what their founder, Guillaume Langereau, describes as a legacy center. That's the term he uses. And I think it is so perfect for what they're doing. It's for everybody, not just the few in the family who may be interested in genealogy. It's not just a genealogy site, although it includes genealogy. You can build or even import your tree with a GEDCOM, so that capability is there, and and you can share it there. But it incorporates the memories you're making today, right? And not just the pictures you're taking, but stories and memories and happenings and So many of us live far apart, right? (laughs) I am so grateful that my family has all kind of managed to make their way to Texas. But I know for many of you listening, that's not always the case. People are all over the country. When babies are born, when marriages happen, when, uh, you know, new jobs and all that stuff, 
you want to be able to visit and share and look at it, but it's not always stuff that you want to necessarily put on Facebook, right? Where it's like the whole world sees every little thing. Um, Sometimes, you know, we're sharing hardships and hard times, but it's all memories and it's all our family and it's the legacy of the family. And that's what they're trying to accomplish here. So every person who's part of your family, who gets involved with Famicity, they, every person has a profile. And that profile is just as much about capturing the personalities and stories and timelines of living people as well as long gone ancestors. You can share that too. integrate that into the communication that you've got going with the kids and the grandkids. It's all about privacy at Femicity. So it's invitation only for your relatives. And there's no advertising. So and it can't be searched or accessed by other people in the public, you know, stuff you put on Facebook, it's searchable on Google. Okay, so it's a different ball game completely. We're talking about long term legacy center somewhere where your family is safe and secure and sharing and being able to be candid and to save these things too for the long term. So the public isn't going to be able to search and check this out. It's just your site and the site is designed to be easy for all ages to use, including grandparents who just who want to get pictures and videos of their grandkids or share their own stories with their grandkids. That's one of the ways I'm using it is it's a chance when something comes to mind, I can sit down and I can record that and share it, but they can view it and and read it when it works for them, right on their own schedule. The company has been very successful in France, uh, where it was launched, and Guillaume is now working to bring the new English platform to the US. And Guillaume tracked me down last year at Roots Tech. It was after the Innovator Summit. And over coffee, he told me his vision for Femicity. And I have to say, I was very impressed, both with him and with Femicity. He's a wonderful guy. It's a wonderful company. And um, there's a lot of storytelling type companies out there. They are really managing to pull all the elements together with a sense of creating a legacy, and yet making it really interactive and kind of like a Facebook sharing, but for the family. I, you know, I told you, Facebook isn't always my favorite place. Um, and I love Instagram, and I can share stuff with the kids and the grandkids with that, but you don't want to share everything. Femicity brings all of this together in one safe, secure place. It's really cool. I'm, I'm excited about it. Okay, people, I'm telling you, I'm excited about it. So I've been watching it progress over the past year, ever since I met Guillaume, and now they're launching a Kickstarter campaign to support their big US launch. And I really want to encourage you to support it. In the show notes, I'm going to have a link for you. We're going to be talking about it on the blog on our website because and so you'll see it in the newsletter. It's coming up, I think the Kickstarter starts January 30th. So it's a campaign where they have built this site, they want to bring in a whole nother new batch of fabulous tools and interactivity and hopefully some synchronization in there and things that genealogists will want. And so they're kicking off the campaign to encourage people to sign up and commit to being a member and trying it for their family, which is going to help them further build the product. It, it's it's kind of a neat way. It really shows whether or not the community at large is interested, finds it really relevant and helpful to them. I think they're going to. I think you're going to. Um, but it's a way to kind of support a company that's really trying to make something awesome happen. So you'll find all the details in the show notes and what we have available now. And when it kicks off January 30th, you're going to hear a lot more. So you'll be hearing certainly in episode 200. If you didn't catch or track down all those details by the time of the Kickstarter campaign, check out 200 because we will mention it there as well. I'm, I'm excited and I'm really happy to support them on it because I think it's really finally the right kind of family sharing website. And I've been looking for one. It's like with Animoto, you know, I, I kind of I get what these people what a lot of the companies are, are moving towards, but they just don't quite get it and where it's all in one place. And Animoto Share made it happen with video. And I love what Femicity is doing with their legacy center. So you'll want to check that out. 
All right, that's the latest news I wanted to tell you about. And let's head over to the mailbox because I want to hear from you. From that girl of mine Saying that she's longing for me All the time Bring me a letter From my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I bet he's glad But more than any other In episode 198, I shared a recording of my conversation with Gay at a genealogy conference when she told me about finding a YouTube video of herself as a child in the front row of a water treatment plant facility dedication of all places. And I found the video and I shared it with all of you. And along with my guess of which person was actually her in the video clip. Well, I heard from her again. And what a relief. I got it right. And here's what Gay wrote to tell us a little more about this. She says, uh, I just heard our interview on the new Genealogy Gems podcast. What fun. I do hope my story serves as an inspiration to other researchers. And you did indeed spot me in the video. Good sleuthing. Next to me in order are my mother, my sister, my grandmother, and my great aunt. Glad you liked the sunglasses. How about that hat? My great aunt, who's from the video, Sally Glasscock Giberson, was one of my genealogy mentors in that I inherited the wonderful research that she did on my mother's side of the family. One of my most prized possessions is a journal scrapbook that she kept in which she recorded a lot of her research, descriptions of her parents and a running account of her life. Interspersed throughout the pages are newspaper clippings, birth announcements, including mine, wedding announcements, graduations, and other meaningful memorabilia. Some years ago, I photocopied all of the pages for safekeeping, and this past year, a friend of mine got them all scanned into a PDF document. From that, I have extracted what she recorded of attending the saline water plant dedication. I thought you might enjoy seeing them. And she did send them to me, and I'll share some of those with you in the show notes. It's pretty fun. So let me get back to her letter. She says, I guess journaling is in the blood because I sporadically kept a diary from about age eight into my teens. And sure enough, I wrote in it on June 21st, 1961. I was nine years old. And I I have scanned that for you to see too. Hope this isn't more than you wanted to know about the subject, but I thought you would find it fun how my family recorded the event I took photos that day too, and I still have them, but I won't subject you to that. Now I'm thinking it would be fun to do something with all of these things, such as making a video or some other way of sharing it. You always have such creative ways to make family history come alive. Now, maybe I can follow some of those great suggestions. Lisa, thank you for all you do and how much you make available for us. I don't know when you have time to be a mother and grandmother too. Your enthusiasm is always contagious and I rarely get to finish a podcast because I'll immediately stop listening so I can try out another great hint or a search technique. Thank you for interviewing me and giving our family another memory. Best regards, Gay. Well, Gay is right. That YouTube video clipping with her family will have a lot more power when she shares the other items from her di- her own diary, from her aunt's scrapbook, all together. Isn't that neat? And she has a story here. Why was that water treatment plant dedication so important? I mean, it seemed to be a pretty big deal. And her diary is really cute. She wrote this in cursive and so neatly, perfect penmanship. She says, Dear Diary, Today, Vice President Lyndon Johnson came to Freeport, Texas to open the saline water plant here. The president couldn't come, 
but over a speaker, he talked from Washington, D.C., and pressed a button to open the plant. So that must have been John F. Kennedy. I took some pictures, too. Also, Channel 13, ABC, and Channel 11, CBS, came out and took pictures for TV. Tonight, we saw ourselves on TV. So the YouTube footage includes President John F. Kennedy's speech from the Oval Office, shows him pushing the button and laughing to an aide, wondering whether or not it worked. And the news clipping that Gay sent offers really a great explanation why this event was important to both a nine-year-old and a U.S. president. And it reminds us how valuable newspapers can be. The news clipping begins June 21st, 1961 may go into the history book someday as marking one of the world's greatest scientific achievements. For on that day, the plant that can extract more than a million gallons of fresh water a day from seawater was dedicated at Freeport. This is the first of five big water conversion plants to be built by the federal government. Others will employ different processes for converting saline or brackish waters. It is possible that one of the other processes will be found the most economical. But for the moment, at least, Freeport is the water conversion capital of the world. (laughs) Well, I hope Gay will create a video that incorporates that historical video footage along with all those different items that she's got and perhaps uh, even a follow-up on what happened next in the history of Freeport, Texas and its history-making water treatment plant. So Gay... For you and for anybody else listening who has some family stories, some goodies they could pull together and you want to turn them into videos, you can go to our webpage devoted to that topic. It's genealogygems.com slash family dash history dash videos. And here is another recording I made at a genealogy conference a while back. And this one is from Barbara. So tell me your name, Barbara Jones. And we're here at NGS 2014, and you walked up to the booth, and you saw the newspaper book. Tell me this story about how you used it. Well, two years ago, when I was at the conference in Cincinnati, Ohio, I bought the book. And, of course, I bought it on the last day. You were sold out, but you were were graciously enough willing to um, send it in the mail to me, free shipping. So when it arrived, I had remembered there was a gentleman at the senior center who needed an obituary. So I thought... I bet maybe there might be something in here, some link that I could find that for him. So I looked through the book, and within 15 minutes, I found that obituary. Wow. So on the next meeting, um, when I went to the Oak Crest Community Center, I presented it to him, and he was so happy he hugged me. So that was great. That's a great story. So the book led to hugs. It did. (laughs) Yeah, he was very grateful. That's wonderful. Are you having a great time here? I'm having a wonderful time. This, This is my third time coming. And the first time we have done the full week, so... It's, it's a big week. It's it is a very days. big week. Yeah. Yes. So what was a highlight in terms of a class? Did you, did you get to a class and you thought, I don't know what I'm going to get, and then you walked out and said, oh, I'm not excited now. Well, I, I have to tell you, my first two conventions coming to NGS, I was really excited about all the vendors. Mm-hmm. But I have to say, this time around, the highlight for me has been meeting the people in attendance oh, and ta- nice. sitting down and talking with them. We just had lunch with um, a couple from Georgia, just sharing stories and seeing what we have in common. And I'm a volunteer art teacher, and and the wife is a uh, retired teacher, and the husband was an engineer. My husband's an engineer. So it's like, you know, we're trading business cards. If you don't have business cards yet, make up a business card. And bring them to the conference. And bring them to the conference and network with people and hand them out. What could be better than making friends with somebody who actually appreciates and understands your passion for family history? Yeah, I sat down next to someone at the conference who has family in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, and I do too. And her <laughs> name just happened to be Barbara. Of all the places in the world, and, and then you two sit down next to each other. We sit down next to each other. Right, and where can I go where I'm sitting in a, a large room with everyone who has research in Pennsylvania? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Well, and step further and better than being on Facebook. You see people out there, but then to have them in the room and be able to share your stories is fantastic. Thank you for sharing your story. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yet another reference to newspaper research. She was talking about my book, How to Find Your Family History in Newspapers, and I'm so glad that it was helpful to her in finding that obituary. 
you know, one of the things people tell me that they like about that book are the appendices that take up a sizable chunk of the back of the book. And one is on US newspaper websites. And uh, the other is for newspaper websites that are outside of the US. So it totally goes international. Barbara also had a great suggestion about carrying a genealogy calling card with you to hand out at conferences. And I think that's a great idea. So we will cover that more in just a little bit. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I'll bet he's glad For more than any other A line from my old mother You know, when folks ask my advice for organizing and securing their family history research, I say plant your family tree in your own backyard and just share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard means keeping one master family tree in a software file on your own computer. That gives you ownership control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. Well, my software of choice is Roots Magic, and that's for so many reasons. I find its tree building tools second to none, simple yet powerful and flexible. With Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. Ancestry.com web hints are coming soon, as is the ability to sync your Roots Magic database and your Ancestry tree. Roots Magic has excellent online free training videos, an active user community, and a companion app for on the go access. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic 7.1 and watch it grow. Get started at RootsMagic.com. Do you have a reliable cloud backup service for your computer yet? If not, everything on it is vulnerable to loss. Your photographs, your genealogy research, losing all of that at once is as devastating as it sounds. And that's why I did my homework and I found a cloud-based backup service provider I love. I chose Backblaze. And now it runs in the background 24-7, automatically saving copies of everything, including my video files. Did you know that some of the leading service providers out there skip your video files when they're backing your files up? Hello, not good. Well, Backblaze is so easy and it covers it all. And I love their free app. It allows me to access my files whenever I need to. And the service is totally affordable for real people. It's just $5 a month. So don't wait any longer to ensure that all your files are safe. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head over to backblaze.com slash Lisa and check it out for yourself. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. Canada is celebrating its 150th birthday this year, and we want to be among the first to offer our congratulations. So to throw our own little party here at Genealogy Gems, I've invited Claire Banton from Library and Archives Canada to join me here today on the podcast. Welcome, Claire. Hello. So great to have you here. I know that you've been working in the reference services at Library and Archives Canada for about 10 years, and I understand you're now Chief of Orientation. So I'm guessing that means you work with kind of a team of people who help other people search for information. It sounds like a pretty awesome job. I do. I do have a fantastic job. And first, I should say thank you for having me on the show. Um, We do have a great job. And so, yes, I started as a reference librarian. And um, now I'm the chief, which means I get to work with the reference technicians and the genealogy consultants who help people find information in our big collections, and it could be any kind of information. And we help people by phone, we help people in person, we help people by email. We do we do have one of the greatest jobs out there, and we get to learn new things every day. And we get to help people connect to information, and it's it's a really 
fulfilling job to be able to help somebody find something that has a lot of meaning for them. And it really, it really shows how me, like they just look like books or documents. And some people think it's very dry, but we really get to see firsthand how meaningful these can be for people and what a difference they can make in, in everyday people's lives. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I know we have a lot of Canadian listeners, we also have a lot of people from around the world, the US, Australia, UK, uh, Europe, and many of these people have ancestors who at some point may have immigrated to Canada. I'd love to have you share with us a little bit kind of a, an overview of who were some of the immigrant groups who came to Canada over time? The waves of immigration to Canada played a huge part in the country we've become and in our history. Um, and there's a huge number of ethnic or immigrant groups that arrived. Those from the British Isles are one of the major groups. So the English, the Irish, the Scottish. There's Germans, there's Ukrainians, there's Mennonite and Dukabors, especially out in the West, Icelandic out in the West. There were African-American settlers that came over at particular times. Uh, what else do we have? There are Chinese and Japanese immigrants, and they've all made their contributions to Canada, and we have differing documents and publications related to all those groups. Well, let's talk specifically about uh, what a genealogist who's looking for some of those ancestors will find at Library and Archives Canada. And I'd love to start with first, especially, what is available for free online? Everything on our website is available, is, is freely available, so you don't have to have an account or pay to use any of our guides or tip sheets online or any of the databases. And there's a lot of information on the website, so it's definitely the best place to start. And there's kind of, you can kind of split the resources that are online into two major groups. There's databases that you can search. And then there's web pages or guides that give you tips on how to search or explain which databases to use or what we an overview of what we might hold on a given topic. And so they they complement each other and we really recommend that people use both when they're on the website. And some of the topics pages will answer some of the really important questions like what we don't have or what you might not find. Um, for example, between the border of the United States and Canada before 1908, there was no border control. People were able to move freely. So there's no government records before 1908 of people moving at across border points between the U.S. and Canada. So that's a really important thing that um, people should know so that and that we make a known on the website that so that people aren't searching for things that they might not find. That's a great point because so often that's what's happening is you know we we know that somebody was going back and forth and so you're searching for something when it turns out that that doesn't even exist. So I love what you said. Go to the website first even if you're going to go in person eventually because you can do so much excellent homework before you go. Absolutely and there um as Especially for genealogists, there are a lot of databases that have been created that are indexed by name, and so you can get a lot done on the website. For example, um, in the last couple of years, we've put up databases for Ukrainian immigrants, for immigrant for porters and domestic immigrants to Canada. We've put up uh, the Carlton Papers Book of Negroes and the Carlton Papers Loyalists and British Soldiers. 1772 to 1784. So those are all things that can be searched from wherever you are before you visit. And you can get a lot done on the website. And then the website will also give you great tips on preparing to visit us because we are a bit different from a public library or from university libraries or genealogy centers that you might have used. And so just to help you make the most of your visit to us, we really recommend that people check out the website because it will help. We would like you to get the most out of your visit to us. And so we have a lot of valuable information there as well. And then the flip side of that is that it's also important to know that although we are continuing to put things online and the website is the best place to start, we do have a huge portion of both collections published and archival that are not online or that aren't indexed um, by name 
online. And so sometimes a visit is necessary. Sometimes we can direct you to where you could find the information nearer to you or to perhaps borrowing something via interlibrary loan that's available from another Canadian library or from us. Well, that's a great point. Because although you guys might have the resources, and then they're fabulous, the fact that you you help your patrons do it the most efficient way, right? The the most cost effective way, time effective way that, that you can help them make those decisions in their preparations. And you mentioned that the Library and Archives Canada is uniquely different from going to a standard library. And I'd love to have you explain that a little bit more, because for some folks, this idea of going to a national archive is is a whole new ball game. And so help them kind of understand what are some of those nuances or differences that they should keep in mind to do it right and to do it most effectively. Thank you for asking that, because I really love making people feel more comfortable about coming to visit us. And we are different, but we're not intimidating and we don't want to be intimidating. So we're here to help. And the thing to know is that we're a national library and a national archive. So we have those two different components of the collection. And because we're national, it means that we collect slightly different things and we collect them in a slightly different way. So on the library side, our collection is primarily built through what's called legal deposit where publishers are required to deposit material. And because our focus is on Canadian material to make sure that we're capturing what gets published in Canada, we're not necessarily acquiring a lot of the most recent publications out of the U.S. on genealogy or out of um, Britain on genealogy. We are focusing on Canadian publications, but what it does mean is that our historical collection of Canadian publications is unparalleled. It's huge. And so things that the local libraries may weed out of their collection because it's no longer up to date or they simply had to make hard decisions because of space, we keep And on the archival side of things, we are the National Archives, which means that the federal government departments transfer materials of historical value to us once they have finished with them. On the archival side of things, as the National Archives, we collect material primarily from the federal government departments. They're required to transfer material of historical value to us once they're done with them. We also acquire some non-governmental records from associations or private individuals of national significance. So what that means is that we have records from across the government of Canada going back in time. So the previous versions of the departments, we have their records as well. So it is a huge collection on both sides, both archival and library because of the breadth and then the history of the collections. And there's a huge wealth of information there that is not necessarily in the local libraries and the staff love their jobs. The staff love the collections and the staff really, really love helping connect people to those collections. So the collections are here to be used. The staff are here to help you. And so we really don't want anyone to feel intimidated about coming to visit us about asking us questions and we are more than happy to explain to people what is or isn't or what might or might not be in the collection and happy to suggest whether our collection is best suited for it or whether or not there might be something closer to home or more on topic for a particular question as well. Well, I appreciate you saying that because I know there are a lot of people who maybe haven't visited a National Archive or library and they wonder, is somebody going to ask me that I have credentials or I'm a professor or, you know, is there some barrier to getting access? And it's not. It's the people's information and and that you welcome the people. And I, I love hearing that. Before I go on to a couple other things I have in mind, I, I was just thinking about all of the types of records and resources that you were talking about that you have, a portion are online, but many are not indexed, not online, that type of thing. Will we find a comprehensive catalog? So can can somebody go to the website and know that they can at least search to see what you have that is only available there physically, but we can work with a catalog online? Or will there be even some things that are only available to search in the catalog in person? 
That's an excellent question, and I wish there was a simple answer, but there's not. <laughs> there, the, the answer is yes, with a caveat. We have a catalog for the library side, which is called Amicus, and we have a catalog for the archival side, which is called Archive Search. And so you can get a start on both of those online. They're both freely available. Um, you don't have to have an account in order to use them. But it's important to know that not everything's indexed by name. And for example, newspaper individual newspaper articles are not indexed. So while you can find out whether or not we have newspapers such as the Halifax Chronicle Herald or the Vancouver Province in the catalog, if you're looking for a particular, particular obituary or announcement, Amicus can't tell you that, but Amicus will definitely tell you whether or not we hold the newspapers. On the archival side, you can definitely get a sense of which departments we hold records from, which private archives we hold, and you can get more information on what's in those archival collections to varying degrees. But again, you won't find every word or even every page or even every file in those archival collections indexed online. So it's really a starting point. And this is where some of the other pages on the website come in handy because they'll explain the limits of what the catalogs can offer you and what your next steps are. And right. if you're still not sure, then we invite you to give us a call because we have an awesome crew that work um, the reference services telephone line and they will definitely be able to tell you about how much you can do online and when you'll need to look at coming in to visit or start purchasing copies of things to consult at home. And that leads me right to my next question, which was, I see that you have a service that allows people to schedule a Skype conversation with a genealogy expert. Is that right? It is. And actually, you can schedule a Skype consultation with a genealogy expert or with a reference librarian or with a reference archivist or all three if your question requires elements from all three. And so what it means is you can talk to somebody via Skype. So for example, if you were looking more for photos and you weren't finding what you needed in archive search, you could schedule an appointment with a reference archivist who can help you delve more deeply into the database and then start um, giving you the heads up on which collections are only available to consult here. If, for example, you were looking for histories of a particular region or you were trying to find government publications that are relevant to your particular ancestor, a reference librarian would be happy to speak with you by Skype about how you do that search in Amicus and whether or not you can find any of those resources closer to home. And then the genealogy staff can help you go over the multitude of resources that are available on the website and then what is also only available here. Sometimes people love the Skype appointment. Sometimes people prefer to send their question in by writing because then they can send the details and the staff member does a bit of digging before sending them an answer back. We have a crew that will answer the phone. So if you think your question is more of a quick question or you're a little bit time crunched, you can definitely call us and the staff at the phone. If they can answer it right away, we'll do so. And if they can't, they'll tell you what the next steps are. So there are multiple ways you can contact us and we have a really, really great group of people here that their job is to help you find information and to explain how we might be able to help you and what you would need to do to move forward. Oh, it sounds like a, an awesome service. And I know people sometimes are timid, or maybe they've had a, a situation where they've contacted, you know, a, a courthouse or whatever, and didn't get a, a perfectly wonderful welcome. But it sounds like you guys uh, will welcome them and help them. And, and really, you've been emphasizing, and I want to just reemphasize to everyone listening that, So often we get focused on our individual ancestors, but really, when it comes to this kind of wealth of information available at an archive or a library like this, we really need to focus first on the collection and, you know, starting at the high point and then working our way down. And if you can identify the right collections and understand what is and what is not there, wow, you have so much more success when you actually do the search. That is super critical. Like yeah. That's an awesome point. And especially for us, and it's a, it's a major learning curve for folks because we're both a library and an archives, and so the tools are different. So one of the first questions you have to ask yourself is, well, would it be published? 
Right. Or would it be not published and then archival? Because that is the first decision point you have to make. Do I search Amicus because it's published or is it archival and I go somewhere else? And then if it's archival, like both ways, there's multiple databases that you could search for it. And then for, say, immigration information, um, if for someone who's trying to track down an ancestor who came, would it be in one of the collections that's specific to an ethnic group? like the Ukrainian immigrants or the Lee Rama collection, or would I be more looking for, say, a passenger list, which is a government document, and so there, there's a different way of searching those. So it is a super key point because the information and the tools are often organized or usually organized by which part of the collection or which collection that information came out of. Yep, absolutely. And that's why talking to somebody who knows the collection like the back of their hand can really help point you in the right direction. I love that. You know, I think about it, we're, we're really used to going on to ancestry or find my past or my heritage. And it's a different kind of search, isn't it? It, it really is. Yeah, it uh, is. And I know people love being able to just drop words into a single search box. Right. And, and I like to explain to people that you can drop a word into a single search box, but then you're going to get 200,000 mm-hmm. hits. And then you either spend the time going through 200,000 hits or you decide whether or not you want to give up. Whereas, you know, you're going to end up saving time in the long run if you end up in the database that actually covers the particular records you need. And even if you have to scan through some a list of results because of name variations or because of other things that affect what was recorded, you've still got a much smaller pool of results to go through and you've got a much greater chance of finding the information you actually need. That's so true. Um, you know, before I ask you about your 150th anniversary, which is fantastic, and that's come, that's all year long here this year, I wanted to, to just touch one more time on, I know because we have a huge number of people in the U.S. who had people going back and forth across the border after 1908. Uh, I know my husband did, his grandfather and his uh, grandmother were going back and forth. What kinds of records, here's an example of if I, that's my question, right? I'm a, I'm a, somebody listening, I'm like, okay, great. What kinds of collections would, would you point us to to say, oh, okay, so we know that they were crossing the border. Where would you point a U.S. uh, researcher to look for that kind of information or to find their ancestor in a particular collection? We would probably point you to the information on our website about border entries, and then we would ask you to think about which dates you're dealing with because there's border entry lists for 1908 to 1918, and then 1919 to 1924, there's what is called Form 30 records, and those are available in a slightly different spot on the website. And then from 1925 to 1935, it's records that are organized by the port of entry and by date of entry. So it really depends on what time period you're looking at. And so you need to know the date. It's helpful to know where it might have happened. And then we have other suggestions that we can make to you to, for example, check the census um, for given years to see if they're popping up in the census because that will give you a clue. It's also important to know that the government of Canada didn't keep records of people leaving the country. It was only people coming in. Okay. Um, And that we would also suggest there's things like city directories and city directories are this huge treasure trove of information. And I really wish more of them were available online. But for example, if they were lodging with somebody, they would show up in the city directories. And because the city directories were done every year, they can be a super valuable resource for the years in between the census. And so we would recommend that you check city directories as well. And we would also point out that NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration for the U.S., um, holds records of arrivals from Canada for the years 1895 to 1954. Mm, super. Oh, wonderful resources. Well, let, let's, before we go, let's talk about your 150th anniversary. From what I've seen online, it looks like the Library Archives in Canada will be celebrating all year long. So what kinds of things have you got planned? Everyone's going to be celebrating all year long. It's going to be amazing. (laughs) So the big thing that we're doing is we're going to have a huge exhibition in the lobby of our public services building at 395 Wellington. Um, That'll be about 
how do we define Canada and what being Canadian means and what we're bringing out is some of the treasures from the collection that very rarely get seen and that represent um, different periods of Canadian history and past ways of thinking about Canada. So we're going to bring out the coat of arms. We're going to bring out the three penny beaver stamp. So for any of the stamp fans out there, that's a, that's a big treat. There's the Selkirk Treaty, which is for the 1840s in Western Canada. There's the geographical map of New France by Samuel de Champlain, which is from the 1600s. That doesn't come out very often. Um, there's going to be the Peter Winkworth Collection of Canadiana, which is this beautiful collection of art that represents different Canadian landscapes. Paint brushes that were said to have been used by Paul Kane during his explorations in Western Canada. We are also working with the Canadian Museum of History to contribute items to the big overhaul they're doing of their exhibit halls. And we've got other activities that are still being planned. So we're going to be busy the whole year. And we're really hoping that people from across the world and our friends in the States are going to come help us celebrate. Oh, well, it sounds amazing. I mean, you're really talking about the treasures of your country. And What a wonderful, wonderful exhibition. I encourage all of you gems out there who are listening to our conversation to check out the show notes for this episode. For more on the resources at Library and Archives Canada, more about their amazing 150th anniversary. Uh, Keep listening in 2017 because Genealogy Gems will be dropping in on some, some more Canadian topics to continue the celebration. And I have been talking with Claire Banton. She's the Chief of Orientation and Reference Services Veteran at Library and Archives Canada. Claire, again, happy birthday to Canada. And thank you so much for sharing your uh, wealth of knowledge with us today. I really appreciate it. I really love being here. Thank you very much for having me. MyHeritage.com is your home for global genealogy research. The site boasts the most geographically diverse membership in the world, with a strong presence in many European countries. Search for cousin connections worldwide among more than 86 million people on a site that operates in over 40 languages. Powerful proprietary search technologies at MyHeritage.com dig deeper and with greater accuracy into billions of historical records and online trees. This is the only major genealogy website that offers automated hinting on possible matches in digitized historical newspapers. And now MyHeritage offers autosomal DNA testing too. They're jumpstarting their DNA database by inviting members to upload their own and by sponsoring tests in certain parts of the world. I'm looking forward to the geographical diversity I anticipate from their DNA data. So head on over to myheritage.com and expand your global genealogy research. That's myheritage.com. Hi, Sunny Morton here, Genealogy Gems Book Club Guru. It's time to announce our book club selection for the first quarter of 2017. I bet this American novelist is already familiar to many of you. She writes a best selling children's book series called Ivy and Bean, and she co authored the runaway international bestseller, The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. I'm talking about author Annie Barrows, and our book club pick is her newest novel, The Truth According to Us. Here's a synopsis to whet your appetite. It's the summer of 1938, and Miss Layla Beck's big problem is not the Great Depression, but that her parents want her to marry someone she hates. She rebels, and next thing she knows, she's been cut off by her father, the senator. Fortunately for her, strings are pulled, and she's assigned to write a local history for the Federal Writers Project. Layla isn't qualified to write the history of the small town of Macedonia, West Virginia, 
but she heads there anyway and begins learning about the lives and dramas of the locals. She finds herself especially drawn into the secrets of the family she's staying with in Macedonia, and drawn to the charms of a certain handsome member of that family. The story is told from Layla's point of view, but also by two members of the family she stays with, one of whom is a spunky young girl. Each of the three narrators sees different sides of the same story you're reading. Remember, the title of the book is The Truth According to Us? That's the whole theme of the book, and that's really why I chose it for the Genealogy Gems Book Club. I think you'll love Layla's chagrin toward the end of the book when she's trying to pin down contradicting versions of the past and write a history that pleases everyone, but that must ignore or outright refute some of the stories those very people told her. I also love that this story is set in the Great Depression and against the backdrop of the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, which produced lots of genealogically useful materials we'll spotlight over the next three months as well. So get your copy of The Truth According to Us and curl up for a fantastic read. It's available in print, on Kindle, and on Audible as an audiobook. Thanks in advance if you purchase the book using the links in the show notes. Those purchases support this free podcast. Genealogy Gems podcast listeners, this is Diane Southard, your DNA guide. I was talking with a fellow mom the other day about all the demands that are placed on our kids this time. They have school and homework, many have after school sports and clubs, religious meetings, some have jobs or at least chores at home, not to mention all the time required to text, check social media, and hang out with friends. As parents and grandparents, we want our children to spend time on things that matter, things that will prepare them for their future lives and mold them into their future selves. According to a 2010 study out of Emory University, if we want to encourage kids toward an activity that will positively impact them, we should steer them towards family history. The researchers reported that, quote, children who know stories about relatives who came before them show higher levels of emotional well-being, end quote. Now, I know I don't need to convince you of this. You are already sold on genealogy. But I share this in the hope that it will push you over the edge and will erase any hesitancy you have about sharing this love with your children and grandchildren. Now, since you know this is me, the genetic genealogist talking, you can probably guess what I'll suggest for getting kids interested in family history. DNA testing is a great way to personally and physically involve them. First of all, there's the tangible process of taking the sample at home, and then marvel at how such a simple act can produce the amazing display of our ethnicity results. Since each of us is unique, it will be fun for them to compare with you and other relatives to see who got what bit of where. This will naturally lead to questions about which ancestor provided that bit of Italian or Irish, and wham, you'll be right there to tell them about how their fifth great-grandfather crossed the ocean with only the clothes on his back, determined to make a new start in a new land. If there are parts of the ethnicity report that you can't explain, use that as a hook to encourage them to start digging and find out why you have that smattering of Eastern European or Southeast Asian. Taking them for a tour of the DNA match page, you can show them how they share 50% of their DNA with their sister, whether they like it or not, and how they share 25% with you, their grandparent. DNA test results give kids a totally unique look at their personal identity with technology that is cutting edge. Looking at their DNA test results can turn into a math lesson, a science lesson, a geography lesson, a lesson on heredity or biology, a discussion on identity, wherever you want to go with it. DNA is the perfect introduction to the wonders that genealogy can hold, especially for children who are so good at wondering. If you're feeling a little bit nervous about explaining this DNA stuff to other people, head over to the Genealogy Gem store and check out our genetic genealogy guides. 
These are a great bite-sized way to introduce genetic genealogy to anyone. You can also check out my video tutorial series. These are bite-sized videos that can help you explain genetic genealogy to anyone. So what are you waiting for? Get started. Invite those you love to be a part of this great work. I'm Diane Southerd, your DNA guide. Profile America, Sunday, January 1st. The place where many of our ancestors first stepped ashore when they came to America seeking a new life opened on this date 125 years ago, Ellis Island in New York Harbor. The very first immigrant processed in 1892 at the new facility was a 15-year-old Irish girl named Annie Moore. Over the course of more than 60 years, some 12 million people flowed through the center. Some sources say the number is considerably higher. The peak year was 1907, when just over a million immigrants came to Ellis Island. The complex now belongs to the National Park Service and is visited by several million people a year. In 1910, the foreign-born represented nearly 15% of America's population. Now, after falling through 1970, that figure sits at 12.9%. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau, online at census.gov. In case that Profile America segment makes you turn your thoughts and curiosity toward your immigrant ancestors who came through Ellis Island, check out the show notes. I have linked to resources on how to research Ellis Island arrivals and the award-winning 30-minute documentary film. It's called Island of Hope, Island of Tears, which is shown on site to visitors when you go and visit Ellis Island there in person. But you can watch it for free online over at YouTube. And um, gosh, they've had over a half million views already. So why not curl up with it on your computer or mobile device next time you sit down to relax? And it's about time for me to sit down and relax. It's time to say goodbye for now. But I want to remind you to join me next month in our milestone 200th episode. I'm really excited about that episode, not just for the celebration, which is cool, but I have a very poignant historical artifact that was discovered in a flea market. And I'll have here on the show the researcher who followed that artifact's story back in time. And you're going to learn how he traced a nearly invisible document trail. I mean, you think you've got it rough. (laughs) This was a nearly invisible documentary trail. And he followed it into the past, And we'll talk about what he discovered. And it's a national treasure. It really is. Until then, I'll leave you with some production credits. I want to thank my podcast content editor, Sunny Morton, for her work on this episode. And of course, your DNA guide, Diane Southerd. Uh, Vienna Thomas is the show's audio editor. Amy Tennant writes for the Companion Genealogy Gems blog. Lacey Cook is our general manager. Hannah Fullerton has just joined the team part-time. You'll see her on the trail this year. And Bill Cook, my better half, he's here as well. He helps make all these things happen behind the scenes. I'm your host and producer, Lisa Louise Cook. And you can learn more about Genealogy Gems. If you're new to us, we're glad you're here. Go check it out, genealogygems.com. From our family here at Genealogy Gems to yours, thank you for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.